Um, we, the Gagnons, are doing something really exciting. Uh, we're building a house. God has blessed us like crazy, and he's given us the opportunity to, to build a house, right? So there's some really exciting, cool things that happen with that. And then there's also some things that um, I'm way out of my depth on. And that's like picking out uh, countertops and cupboards and flooring and colors, which, as you can tell, I wear clothes from Walmart. This is, I'm not a, I, don't, I don't pick out colors. Uh, for the record, we picked out Uba Tuba granite, just so everybody knows. Um, Uba Tuba, I mean, it's the best name. How do you not go with that? But we're building this house, right? And then while we're building this house, uh, you get to see kind of the thing. And it's, it's a little weird. And while this is happening, um, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to the weather, but apparently 2020 also wants to throw tropical storms and hurricanes, too. Well, normally, like, that's not as big a deal for us Floridians, like we see that a lot. But then when you have a house that's not completely built, and it doesn't even have a roof yet, and you start wondering, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, like, what, how does that work? Or what happens? Or, you know, because there's not a roof to actually cover up from a storm, like, what's, what's going to happen with all this stuff? And you get, you get a little anxious about it. I mean, I'm sure the builders deal with this stuff, and they can, they can take care of it. But... Um, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say I got a little bit anxious and a little bit worried about it. And then God does this thing where he constantly points out to us these um, spiritual truths through physical things. God has been doing this since the beginning, and then Jesus kind of just killed it. So for me, it's like looking at this house and thinking, okay, um, our society is incredibly anxious right now. Like, there's a lot of storms going around, uh, and we're worried about things that are going to fall apart, and will we be able to make it through all of this, and what's going to happen? And the Bible tells us, uh, through James, that trials uh, actually pers produce pers perseverance through faith. And it's like, yay, I want more trials so that my faith can be stronger, said no one ever. No one believes, no, no, like the most spiritually mature person is like, yeah, God, I'd rather like become more spiritually mature through watching other people's trials. I don't want to go through my own, right? But God uses that. God brings us through trials and he allows us to go through drama and trouble and pain and heartache and poor relationships and brokenness to produce this kind of faith that can withstand the storm, that can withstand the tropical storm slash hurricane slash next hurricane slash is the house going to make it? Uh, we'll see. But if it's built on a foundation of Jesus and Jesus's gospel of paying for all of our sins, that house will last no matter what the hurricane, no matter what the storm. So knowing that that's true helps our day to day lives, but it doesn't make it easy. So before we jump into this passage in Luke chapter 11, let's go ahead and open up with the disciples prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we've been studying through this refocus series, the idea of getting our eyes to, to refocus on Jesus and who he is and what it is that he has done so that we can have a, a, a more complete picture of the God that we serve. Now, the passage that we're going to, to read here in a moment, um, they got a full picture of Jesus. And just giving you a heads up, Jesus is not a very good dinner guest. So Luke chapter 11, we're going to begin in verse 39, but I just want to set the stage real quick, right? So we've been studying that Jesus has been dealing with a lot here, okay? Uh, they said that he worked with the devil. Uh, they said that he's not God. I mean, all this stuff has been going on, and he's been teaching constantly, so while he's teaching constantly, you had this religious structure of the time. You have the Pharisees and the Sadducees, okay? Think like the religious bigwigs, OK? 
Okay? And these religious bigwigs got a problem because this Jesus guy is kind of threatening the structure that they found themselves in that's quite frankly worked out pretty well. Uh, they get all the best waves in the marketplace, which we're going to read. Everyone makes sure to know who they are, and they're, they're, ha- they're very notorious in a positive light. People think of God when they look at these people. And then Jesus shows up and says, um, no, no, I am God. And can you see how that would be a little bit of a challenge to some of their authority? So a Pharisee has an idea. Hey, uh, I'm going to invite Jesus over for dinner. So you say, hey, Jesus, all this teaching, got to know more about it. Come on over. Let's, let, let, let's go have a meal. And then they go to sit down for the meal. And what do we tell our kids to do before we eat every time? Wash your hands, right? Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, right? Okay, especially now, wash your hands. Side note, wash your hands. Um, but, okay, it's like wash your hands. And then Jesus sits down to eat. And Jesus doesn't wash his hands. And this Pharisee notices it and is like, what? Why is this guy not washing his hands? And that's where we pick up in verse 39. Let's read it together. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisee, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside also make the inside? But now as for you, what is inside you Be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because of you, God, because uh, because you give God a tenth of your mint, your rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. These you should have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. So, they go to sit down for this meal. Jesus doesn't wash up. The Pharisee sees it and goes, whoa, what's up with that? That's weird. And Jesus takes that physical reaction, right? That's something that's happening in the physical world to point out a spiritual truth. And the spiritual truth is that you've cleaned yourself up. You made yourself look awesome. Your hair's perfect, right? You showered. You even put on deodorant, right? You smile at everybody. You make it look like, oh, you know what? You know what? I love to be around people. I'm a big people person, right? I make sure that everyone knows my name. I look glorious. But inside... I'm vile. Inside, I'm wicked. I'm full of greed. I'm full of agitation, frustration, anger, bitterness. But on the outside, I'm smiling, man. Everything is going great. How you doing is the most loaded question in American language. Because we don't really want to know. We don't really want to know how other people are doing. We just want them to smile back so that we can move on to tell them what's important with us. What's going on with us. And Jesus calls this man in his own home where he's used to getting the best greetings and he's used to everyone respecting him above all. And he's used to being kind of known as the guy. And he calls him wicked and full of greed. And he says that you neglect justice and the love of God. So why do we walk around with this anger and this frustration and this bitterness when we walk like a Pharisee, when we walk in this stuff? Why do we, why do we live with it? Why, 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 why do we make it look a certain way on the outside, but on the inside we're, we're vile? The answer is unbelief. The answer is do we really believe that what we believe is really real? Do you believe that the God of the universe can deal with your emotions, can deal with your lust, can deal with your anger, can deal with your sadness? 
Or do you believe that that's just your burden to bear? That's just what you got to walk with. So therefore, you allow it to pollute your insides, and you're not good for anything. Because from the outside, that cup looks glorious. It's completely clean. But on the inside, it's full of mold. And if you pick up that cup and you drink from that cup, you're going to get sick. And the God of the universe has called us to go out into our communities, into our neighborhoods, and to love people and to show them who he is. But we're trying to offer them moldy water. Because we haven't allowed Jesus to deal with our own stuff. We've, we've gotten, we, we're all cool with the idea of like coming to church. And you know what? You know, it's, there's a benefit to me. People respect me. People look at me a certain way because I claim to know Jesus. There's, there's some good stuff that I get. But I don't really trust that he can deal with it all. But if you notice, he didn't end there. He then jumps in and says in verse 42, woe to you Pharisees, because you give a tenth of your mint, your rue, and all kinds of herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. So now Jesus is amping it up. He's saying that not only are you dead inside, but you have these actions that you do. You, you put your money in the plate. You give your offering, right? You make sure that you're involved financially with what God is doing. You, you give, you give, and you make sure people know that you give but you neglect justice and the love of God. What is that giving for if it's not for the people who don't know Jesus? What's the point? You don't show others the love that he has showed you in saving you from your sin. You're too busy with yourself to be bothered to love others. You neglect the love of God. What is it you have to offer other people? It's, it's great that you, you give of your gifts. But on Monday, the money that you gave to the church doesn't affect the people that you work with. What are you giving to them? What do you have to give to them? When you go to hand them that cup, or is it moldy water? But Jesus, being Jesus, didn't stop there, right? He then said that they're like unmarked graves, okay? Now, that's a little bit of a strange one, right? Okay, I get the whole cup, moldiness on the inside. I even get the giving, but not really actually following God, just, you know, kind of feeling like you're obliged to do it, like I have to do this thing. But unmarked graves. You know what an unmarked grave looks looks like? Picture a cemetery in your head. Take away every headstone. What does it look like? Looks like grass. Looks like a field. You may want to lay in it. You may want to roll in it. It's just, it, it's nice, right? But what's inside? Dead bodies. Jesus said to this person at his own dinner table, in his own house, you appear alive, but you're dead. You make it look to the world like you're pleasant. Like everything is as it should be. You're a benefit, right? You're, you're, you're picturesque. But really inside, you're completely dead. Removing the appearance of sin doesn't deal with the sin. That's what hypocrisy is. The Pharisees' issue here, the Pharisees' sin, is they had done such a big big job. Everything was about removing the appearance of sin. But they hadn't dealt with the sin. And we as a church have this problem too, right? Like this has been going on forever. We, we, We want to remove the appearance that we have done something wrong, but not actually given the sin over to the only God that can actually pay for the sin. We want to sit there and we break the screen door, right? Everyone has probably done this, right? You've broken something as a kid. And then what you do is you set it back up so that it looks like it's not broken. So then when dad grabs the door, it's holding his hands. You're like, what'd you do? We've all done this. And the problem is, is that we're still doing it. 
We want to remove the appearance of the sin, not actually deal with the sin. And the problem is unbelief. The problem is not believing that the God of the universe who allowed you to to be born would equip you to be reborn. That's our problem. That's this Pharisee's problem. This Pharisee had fallen in love with the structure of religion, but not the benefits of the relationship with God. Now, this was really interesting to me because the structure of church is actually really appealing. I know that sometimes in, in today's world, we kind of think that people don't want to go to church, right? But, if you, but seriously, think about it with me for a second. The things that church offers are actually pretty appealing. Church offers community, friendship. It offers a place to go and connect with each other. It, it offers structure. Think about the single mom who has kids that, that needs some structure. Church offers some good things. So people can fall in love with the offerings of a church, the quote-unquote programs of a church, but never fall in love with the Messiah who is the husband of that church. This happens every day. It continues. It's hypocrisy. And what's crazy is that Jesus says that not only is hypocrisy wrong, it's foolish. He says that all the sin will be brought into light. Everything that's hidden will be out in the light. So think about that for a second, okay? So maybe you're in the sound of my voice, and maybe full tilt, you're the hypocrite, okay? Maybe you've decided, you know what, I'm on board with this church thing. I go every Sunday. I give my money. I'm a part of, uh, you know, publicly I'm a part of what's going on with God. But I'm not willing to surrender my life over to Jesus. I'm not real willing to have that relationship with God because, you know what, I don't believe that he can really save me from my sin. Because I'm past forgiveness. Because I'm too busted. Because I'm not ready. Whatever, whatever excuse you have, fill in the blank. Jesus says that that hypocrisy is wrong, which I think we can all understand it's wrong to pretend to be something that you're not, but it's also foolish. Don't miss the second point. It's boneheaded. Because at the end of, the, at the end of life, you're either going to be a follower of Jesus when you're in heaven or you're not. So he's saying everything's going to be on display. We have this idea that there's this screen on our chest that keeps God from seeing what our heart is really like. Because we've allowed every, we've fooled everyone else. Everyone else believes it. But God is the one that matters, not everyone else. To be a hypocrite is not the gospel, it's selfishness. It's the opposite of the gospel. It's the opposite of surrendering yourself to Jesus. It's the opposite of being a Christ follower. And it's, it's just boneheaded. Thankfully, our sermon doesn't end there. <laughs> Thankfully. We're going to jump ahead a bit and we're going to jump to chapter 12 because Jesus continues with some lawyers in these next couple of verses and he gives it to them too. But I think, I think we all got the point with that. So chapter 12, verse 1, reads like this. Uh, so they're sitting at the table. Jesus has already confronted the Pharisees. He's confronted the lawyers. And now they're stepping outside the house. Okay, So they're coming outside the house. Remember, Jesus has been teaching a ton of people. He's got a lot of notoriety. And let's see what happens. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you in hell. 
Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten by God? Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about what you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you are to say. So Jesus gets up from this meal. Obviously, the Pharisees and the lawyers are pretty upset because Jesus is attacking the social structure that has been a benefit to them for quite a long time. They're a little agitated. They're a little frustrated. And they're very smart. And they know the law. So what are they going to do? They're going to start to try to trip him up and ask him some questions. But Jesus does this thing where he walks outside and there's a crowd of people there. And he's talking to the crowd. And as he's talking to the crowd, he has his disciples with him. And he turns and he addresses the disciples. So he's in front of this crowd that's like a concert. And in that moment, he decides that's when he's going to discuss with the disciples what to watch out for. And what does he warn them to watch out for? The hypocrisy that is like yeast that will infect everything eventually. So he's talking to the people that are following him. And he warns them to not be like the people that they just had a meal with. And he says to them, it will be very easy for you to allow a little hypocrisy into your life and how that, that leaven, right, that yeast, that will infect everything. He warns against it. He then encourages them not to fear the pain of people because that pain ends, it's just physical, right? And... You ever thought for a second, like, that's pretty easy for Jesus to say he's God? Right? You ever thought of Jesus, look, it's just, it's just torture and pain. Well, yeah. So it's going to hurt. But the reason that he can make that claim is he's seen the other side. And he's seen what the torture and pain of hell would be in comparison to physical torture and pain for us now. That's a different ballgame. So he encourages them to not worry about that stuff. Don't allow the approval of man to be what you seek out for. Work for the approval of God. Think about this for just a second, right? These Pharisees, these lawyers, they would say that they practice the law better than anybody. They would say that they understand the law of God. They do everything right. They give the exact amount when it comes to their giving. They, 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 they honor the Sabbath. They honor the festivals. They are locked into the law. But the Bible says that at the end, when they're standing before God, you know what they hear? Depart from me. I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. How tragic is that? The people who thought they were following the law to such a degree that they were scholars missed it completely. And that's the message they hear at the end. What could be worse than that? But Jesus doesn't end there with them. He says, not only should you go out and you should listen and you should follow and you should acknowledge me publicly, because if you acknowledge me publicly, I will acknowledge you in the throne room of God. He says, I will equip you with the Holy Spirit because when you follow me, when you go out into the neighborhoods that I've called you into, you're not going to know what to say. You're not going to know what words need to come out of your mouth to pierce the heart of the person that I am trying to save. Because how could you? 
but the Holy Spirit does. And he promises that. He promises that he will acknowledge us in the throne room of God, and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant, to the person who follows him. Now, the following of, some, of God, right, means going where he would have us go and doing what he would have us do. So how do we do that? Okay? It's one thing to acknowledge it, right? I think, I think we all kind of understand the idea of what, what we need to do to follow God. But how do you do that? Because quite frankly, right now, it's crazy out there. Like, what are we doing? He says, follow the Holy Spirit. I've promised the Holy Spirit to give you the words to speak when you're in front of those that you would not be prepared to speak in front of. So he says that he will acknowledge us in heaven as we acknowledge him now. And we are to follow him in this call. So what does it look like to go and reach people in a world that is a global pandemic, millions are scared and afraid, and even millions more are angry. Okay? It's a world divided against itself that publicly acknowledges that it seems like revelation out there, but they don't believe that revelation is real. How many of us have had this conversation? People that don't believe in God are talking as if it's the end times. How do we reach people during this time? How are we to follow God when our entire globe is confronted with pain, loss, and death, and death at a level that probably hasn't been around since World War II. We pray. We ask the Holy Spirit, who God promised us, how we are to live, how we are to act, how we are to love people, because people need love. The entire societal structure feels like it's at its breaking point. I work in retail. A grown man threatened to fight me this week. I'm serious. Balled up his fist and threatened to fight me. People, people are losing it, guys. People need to know who the God of the universe is. Their entire structure, their system, their social system is built on their comfort and what it is that they want. And it's being shaken to its very core. And the benefit of that is that they are thinking eternally now. The world is thinking eternally. God has given us the message to give them. He's given us the gospel. He's equipped us through the Holy Spirit. The question is, will we go? Will we follow him? Are you willing to pray for the boldness of the Holy Spirit to reach your neighbor? Because it's one thing to want to do it. It's another thing to do it. Hypocrisy is removing the appearance of the sin, but not dealing with it. It would be hypocrisy for us not to reach out into the communities that we have been called to, especially now. The world needs the message of Jesus. And as we've studied through this refocus series, right? As we've studied through it, we've been given this image of Jesus, this clear image of Jesus, this whole idea of this entire series was to give us a more clear picture of who Jesus Christ is. And now that we have that message, we are renovated, right? Remember what Pastor Michael taught a few weeks ago? We are renovated now when all we wanted to do was kind of remove stuff around. Everything's different. We know who Jesus is. So now that we know... What do we do? Is the church the cup that looks really pretty, but inside is full of mold? What's going on? Do we appear as if we're doing the work of ministry, but we're not? What could be more tragic? 
our neighbors need to know Christ and they need to know Christ now. The follower of Christ has been made a new creation brought from death to life. That God who brought us from death to life has promised to return. And when he returns, will his bride be ready? We will be made ready by following him now. And following him now is speaking for him like he has promised to speak for us. The question is, will we do it? Father in heaven, Lord, um, your word is so convicting. Your, your word points out, Lord, the inadequacy, uh, inadequacy, and I can't even say the word, God. It points out how ill-equipped we are to do the work that you've given us. And we could, we could be there, Jesus, we could just, we just live there for a second and just think about, we can't do this, we can't do this, we can't do this, and then your response to that is, I know, I know you can't. You can't save the world. You weren't designed to. You are saving the world, God, and you're doing it through us. We're a piece of it. We're not it. Help us to speak for you the way that you've called us to. Help us to notice small hypocrisies in our own life, Lord, that can grow into large ones. You're the God of the universe who sees every sin we've ever committed and ever will commit, and you still love us. Thank you that we can cling to that truth this morning, Lord, and also thank you that we have that truth to pass along to our neighbors. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.